<laughs> Small but mighty crew today. Good to see. Uh, just one thing at the top, and then uh, I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, this morning, together with the president of the World Food Prize Foundation, we announced the 2022 World Food Prize Laureate. Commonly known as the Nobel Prize for Agriculture, the award recognizes the achievements of individuals who have, who have advanced human development by improving the quality, quantity, or availability of food in the world. This year's winner is American climate scientist, Dr. Cynthia Rosenzweig, who works at the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Dr. Rosenzweig is being recognized for her four decades of pioneering work improving the world's understanding of climate change impacts on agriculture. We offer her our congratulations and gratitude for this critical work. The World Food Prize Foundation's mission is to advance human development by improving the quality, quantity, or availability of food in the world, engaging in cutting edge global food security issues, and inspiring the next generation to end hunger uh, it's a mission that is critical to addressing food security challenges of today and preparing to feed future generations. Already a critical concern due to the impacts of the climate crisis, the problem of food insecurity is now even more acute as President Putin's war in Ukraine has put millions around the globe at risk. And addressing this issue is a top priority for the U.S. government. This morning, as you saw, the department announced the appointment of Dr. Kerry Fowler, a noted agriculturalist, as U.S. Special Envoy for Global Food Security. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield announced the United States will launch a week of action to address food insecurity across the globe later this month, which will include a ministerial level meeting on May 18th at the UN in New York and an open debate in the UN Security Council about food insecurity and armed conflict the following day on May 19th. On March 24th, President Biden announced $1 billion towards additional humanitarian assistance for Ukraine and global food security. These funds will provide food, shelter, clean water, medical supplies, and other forms of assistance to those affected by Russia's invasion. President Biden has also committed $11 billion to support long-term food security priorities. Once approved by Congress, these funds will be used at home and abroad to support long-term efforts to bolster food security, enhance supply chain resilience, and provide humanitarian aid, including to those affected by this war. This is in addition to our ongoing work with allies and partners to combat food insecurity, which has been exacerbated by Russia's destructive war on Ukraine. With that, happy to take your questions. Thanks, Ed. Um, before I get to um, policy matters, Secretary, um, I presume, maybe, maybe not, uh, you've spoken to him. Is he doing okay? He is on the phone. He is uh, experiencing only the same mild symptoms. I expect uh, he'll continue to have uh, phone conversations I uh, speak with uh, staff here, counterparts around the world, uh, members of Congress, uh, and others uh, over the next couple of days. And I know he looks forward to returning to the office just as soon as he can. Okay. Um, yesterday, uh, before uh, his uh, positive uh, PCR test, he met with um, the Swedish foreign minister, um, who said afterwards uh, in an interview that um, she had spoken to him about the very real possibility that Sweden would apply for NATO membership, and that the secretary uh, responded that the U.S. is willing, would be willing to provide security assurances to Sweden in, uh, uh, in the interim period between application and accession. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us if uh, tell us anything more about that. If that is is actually correct and if there were any specifics involved or what those assurances might be? Well, they had a wide-ranging discussion. It was a uh, follow-on discussion uh, to uh, the many conversations, including the in-person meeting uh, that the foreign minister and the secretary had uh, when the secretary was in Stockholm for the OSCE meeting uh, late last year. It not only uh, broached uh, Russia's ongoing uh, war in, UK in Ukraine and the attendant issues there, uh, but we cooperate closely with Sweden on a host of bilateral and global issues. Uh, that includes food security, uh, advancing democracy, uh, human rights around the world. Sweden has been instrumental in promoting and helping to uh, build upon uh, the ongoing truce uh, in Yemen. Uh, we, they discussed areas uh, of cooperation between the U.S. and the EU as Sweden prepares to assume the presidency 
uh, of the Council of the European Union in 2023. Of course, they did have an extended discussion on Russia's actions in Ukraine and the implications uh, of it. Uh, as we've said before, every country has a right to choose its own path. Every country has a right to determine for itself uh, its foreign policy, its alliances, its partnerships. Uh, and when it comes to NATO, uh, that is a decision for the 30 members of the alliance and the aspirant country uh, and nobody else. We have consistently made clear our commitment to NATO's open door policy. Uh, NATO's door remains open to aspirant countries when they are ready and able to meet the commitments and obligations of uh, membership and to contribute to security in the Euro-Atlantic area. When it comes to Finland and Sweden, as we've said before, both are valued partners of NATO. They're valued partners of the United States. We remain firmly committed to uh, this open door policy. Uh, of course, the NATO Secretary General uh, has recently noted that allies would welcome uh, Sweden and Finland. Uh, and as the Secretary General himself said, uh, I am certain that we will find ways to address concerns they may have regarding the period between the potential application and the final ratification. Uh, the discussion uh, yesterday noted that uh, Sweden has not made any formal public announcement about its intentions uh, to um, put forward a, uh, an application for NATO. Uh, there was a hypothetical uh, discussion uh, about that and related issues. Um, but uh, as we've said, our commitment to NATO's open door, uh, that is firm. It is an open door that uh, should remain open, must remain open uh, for any country that can meet those stringent application requirements. Well, okay, fine. But uh, uh, obviously they haven't yet applied for it, but it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. So the idea that it's a hypothetical question, uh, you know, in the realm of hypothetical questions, it's less of a hypothetical than, say, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to insult any country here, but like some, you know, very, very tiny country, you know, launching a, uh, a lunar expedition. Uh, this is something that is clearly going to happen and that people are preparing for. So what, what, so what is it that you guys can offer to Sweden and potentially Finland. What I would say, Matt, is um, in in, the, in that interim in that interim period. What, what I would say is that this will remain a hypothetical until it's not a hypothetical. Uh, and at this stage, neither Sweden nor Finland uh, has put forward uh, a firm intention uh, to seek NATO membership. That could change in the coming weeks. We'll leave it to those countries or any other country uh, to speak for itself. Uh, I will just add uh, this uh, without going too far down uh, the hypothetical rabbit hole. Uh, our countries, our militaries uh, have worked together for years. Uh, we are confident that we could, as uh, parallel to what the NATO Secretary General said, find ways uh, to address any concerns either country uh, could have about the period of time between a NATO membership application uh, and a country's potential accession uh, to the NATO alliance. But again, this remains a hypothetical, and until it is not a hypothetical, it's best uh, left right. in, well, in those terms. Just, look, it's a hypothetical. <laughs> it's right now 2.14 p.m. It's also a hypothetical that it's going to be 2.15 p.m., okay? You, so you, you, you obviously are making plans for this very likely eventuality. Um, and so, the, so you're just not prepared to discuss what those are. Is that the answer to the question? You you are uh, putting this in terms that are now more. Now two fifteen. You so you, are, hypothetical is you, are, you are hypothetical. you are putting this in terms that are more certain than what we've heard from uh, our Finnish and Swedish partners. So I will allow our Finnish and Swedish partners uh, to speak for themselves. Uh, and if and when they do make that decision or make any other decision, uh, we'll be prepared to speak to it in more concrete terms. Can I follow terms. up, though? Sure. Does the United States have any intelligence or assessments or concerns that Russia will launch any kind of attack on Sweden and Finland if they apply? Uh, I do not have, uh, we don't have any such information uh, and uh, certainly nothing to, to speak to. Uh, we've made very clear that we are committed to our partners uh, in, in Europe, of course, uh, when it comes to NATO allies, we have uh, an Article 5 commitment. It's an ironclad commitment uh, that an attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, but as we are demonstrating in the context of Ukraine, 
uh, we have a commitment to partners across Europe. And as I said before, uh, Sweden, Finland, many other countries uh, across the continent that are uh, not members uh, of NATO, they are uh, strong stalwart partners of the United States. In some cases, they are members of uh, the EU and we're committed to those uh, partnerships. Stephanie. Uh, follow up as well. Did the secretary have detailed discussions yesterday with the foreign minister on what that support would look like during the period of application? Well, this goes back to uh, Matt's hypothetical. I will just say. It's not uh, a hypothetical. You just said that they discussed it. <laughs> I, I, they, they discussed NATO's open door policy uh, and they discussed uh, uh, various uh, possibilities in, in hypothetical terms. I would say uh, it was not a conversation that uh, was deep on the specifics at this point, just because it remains a hypothetical. Yes, Jenny. Thank you, Ned. Uh, I have a quick question as a China. And Can we stay in Ukraine? Sure, let, we'll take uh, a couple questions on. Uh, did the US uh, pledge any financial aid uh, to uh, Ukraine in the Poland conference today? Uh, so we did. Uh, as you alluded to, there was uh, a pledging conference and through the uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, we are providing and pledged nearly $387 million in additional humanitarian assistance to Ukraine uh, amid this uh, war. Uh, this, of course, is in addition to the more than $1 billion in humanitarian assistance uh, to vulnerable communities in the region uh, since Russia first invaded Ukraine eight years ago. Uh, including more than $688 million, almost $700 million uh, this year alone. Uh, you've heard us say this before, but the United States has been uh, and is the largest single, single country donor of humanitarian assistance uh, to Ukraine. On, in late March, on March 24th, President Biden announced uh, that we would be prepared to provide more than $1 billion uh, in new funding towards humanitarian assistance for those affected uh, by the Kremlin's war in Ukraine it's, and its severe impacts uh, around the world, including, as I alluded to at the top, a market rise in food insecurity. Uh, we've also put forward uh, for Congress's consideration uh, a supplemental uh, budget request that has uh, additional funds, not only for security assistance, not only for economic assistance for Ukraine, uh, but also for humanitarian assistance for those displaced by Russia's war inside Ukraine, uh, and those refugees who have been forced to flee Ukraine, who are now uh, in the region and in some cases further beyond. Except 370. Uh, 387 million dollars. Yeah. Uh, anything else on Russia, Ukraine? I have uh, one on Russia. Sure. sure. Uh, following Trevor Reed's release last week, has there been any contact between the U.S. and Russian teams on the potential release <laughs> of other detainees, including Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner? Uh, so I will say that prior to Trevor Reed's release, you didn't hear us speak of our uh, communication, our dialogue uh, with the Kremlin, with the Russian Federation uh, regarding uh, any uh, preparations, any plans, uh, any efforts to do so. Uh, and that is chiefly because we have found that in these cases, uh, we can be more effective uh, if we are afforded the opportunity to have discussions that are outside uh, of public view, uh, that are uh, not conducted uh, in public, but are rather uh, private. What I will say generally is that there have been long-standing efforts uh, to free, in the case of Russia, uh, Paul Whelan. Uh, of course, you heard us yesterday that we now consider uh, Brittany Griner to be a case of wrongful detention. Uh, her case will now be handled and is now handled uh, by Ambassador Roger Carstens, our special presidential envoy for mm -hmm. uh, hostage affairs. Uh, those efforts to uh, secure their release are ongoing, just as our efforts to secure the release of Americans who are detained uh, around the world. Uh, yes, Jenny. You said we'd be hearing more from the U.S. in the lead up to May 9th. Um, is that going to be support for Ukraine? Are those punitive measures? What Can you tell us anything? Uh, I suspect you will uh, hear us uh, put forward elements that will allow us to continue our strategy. Uh, it is a strategy that has, in the context of Ukraine, uh, had two primary elements. Uh, one is significant security assistance, significant support uh, for uh, those brave defenders of Ukraine's democracy, its freedom, uh, its independence, and its territorial integrity. Uh, to date, uh, we have uh, contributed uh, nearly $4 billion uh, since the start of the invasion to this effort. Uh, this is security assistance that has proved to be a key enabler of the success that our uh, Ukrainian partners uh, have been able to demonstrate on the battlefield. And if you just take a step back and think about where we are 
Uh, we're now 70 days uh, into Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, Russia has lost the Battle of Kyiv. Russia has uh, been forced to narrow its aims. Its aims have gone from an attempt to take an entire country, uh, to subjugate an entire uh, people, uh, to essentially uh, redraw the map of Europe, uh, to focus its military objectives uh, on the south uh, and the east, continuing uh, its brutal campaign, but with objectives uh, that are far different uh, from what Vladimir Putin, by uh, many accounts, had in mind uh, when his forces went into Ukraine on February 24th. Uh, we'll continue with that security assistance. We'll also continue, on the other side of the ledger, to apply unprecedented amounts of pressure uh, on the Kremlin. And we've done that together with dozens of countries around the world, spanning four continents, uh, with financial sanctions, with export control measures, uh, with uh, efforts to uh, reduce and wean uh, dependence on Russian energy uh, that has uh, for too long been a source uh, of revenue for the Kremlin and for more recently uh, the Kremlin's war machine in Ukraine. Both of these things combine to strengthen Ukraine's hand on the battlefield and to strengthen Ukraine's hand uh, at the negotiating table uh, because our strategy is to see to it uh, that Ukraine emerges from this victorious uh, Ukraine will do so uh, at the negotiating table. Our goal is to strengthen uh, Ukraine's position uh, at that negotiating table as we continue uh, to place mounting costs on the Russian Federation. Yes. The Richardson Center has confirmed that the former ambassador to the UN is taking on Brittany Griner's case. Uh, is this welcome news to the State Department? Can you comment? I, look, we appreciate all of those who are very invested in this case. Uh, and uh, Brittany Griner is fortunate uh, to have uh, a network who has supported her uh, from uh, day one. We have worked very closely with that network. Uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to others, uh, we do often uh, uh, partner um, with various individuals uh, and organizations on these cases. Uh, but it's not something that we speak to uh, publicly. We welcome uh, all of those efforts that are coordinated closely with us uh, that might help to seek. Uh, the safe release of uh, any American who's unjustly detained around the world. Yes. Uh, how concerned are you that Russia has said that any uh, weapons deliveries from the U.S. or other NATO countries would be a legitimate target? We're not going to respond to Russian bluster, to Russian propaganda. I think you've heard from my counterpart at the Department of Defense uh, that we continue to have uh, the unimpeded ability to flow uh, weapons uh, and security assistance into Ukraine. Those deliveries have, uh, whether it's from the United States or from our allies and partners around the world, uh, been occurring almost daily. Uh, the fact that we have been able to announce such large drawdowns, the last two of which have been $800 million, nearly $4 billion since the start of the war, and then to deliver that uh, within uh, oftentimes days uh, of making the announcement speaks to the fact that we are able to uh, uh, process uh, those drawdowns to deliver uh, those weapons uh, precisely to our Ukrainian partners, what they need, so they then can take it uh, precisely to where they need it most. Yes, Jenny. Thank you, Ned. Uh, on North Korea and China, uh, will additional U.S. sanctions on North Korea be adopted in these months? UN Security Council resolution. If China and Russia uh, use their veto, uh, then what happens? Well, this is something that we are discussing with our allies and partners around the world. And in the first instance, we're having these discussions uh, with our treaty allies in the Indo-Pacific. We've talked about uh, our ironclad commitment to the defense of uh, Korea, the Republic of Korea, uh, and to Japan as well. And so in the aftermath of these most recent provocations, including the three ICBM launches uh, and the ballistic missile launches, uh, this week we have continued those conversations uh, with our allies. Uh, but we are also discussing this with a broader set of allies and partners around the world. That includes in New York, uh, where our ambassador there, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield and her team uh, have been engaged on the challenge that is posed by North Korea's ballistic missile and its nuclear weapons program. Uh, it is a challenge, it is a threat to international peace and security that uh, the UN Security Council and its members have recognized in the past. 
Uh, the UN Security Council and its members, including all five permanent members in the past, uh, have uh, signed on to a string of UN Security Council resolutions. That's precisely why the ballistic missile launches this week, the ICBM launches uh, in recent weeks, uh, have been an affront to multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Uh, so we're not going to get ahead of any steps that uh, the UN might take or the UN Security Council uh, might take, but we do think that accountability uh, is important. Uh, we do think it's vital that the international community, our allies, as well as partners around the world, uh, send a very clear signal to the DPRK uh, that these types of provocations won't be tolerated, uh, they won't improve its strategic positioning, uh, and the world will respond accordingly. On China, uh, yesterday, Chinese foreign ministry said the U.S. was responsible for North Korea's continued missile uh, violations. Uh, what is your reaction of uh, Chinese blaming the United States? I'm not going to react to the Chinese reaction, especially to uh, one like that. Uh, what I will say is that uh, the PRC and the DPRK equally uh, know where we stand on this. We have and we harbor no hostile intent towards the DPRK. It is our goal, uh, as it is the goal of other allies and partners uh, in the region and around the world, to see the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We believe we can affect, we can affect that uh, through diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, that is what uh, we seek to have. Uh, we have made very clear to the DPRK, we've made very clear publicly to all of you uh, that we are prepared uh, to engage in that dialogue towards the end uh, of the uh, complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, in the absence of uh, discussions with the DPRK, uh, we are engaged concertedly with our allies, uh, Japan and the Republic of Korea, uh, but also with allies and partners around the world. Uh, Michelle. Matt, uh, on Syria, uh, Austin Thai's parents have uh, said yesterday that the president has uh, pledged to uh, engage directly with the Syrian regime to free uh, Austin. Uh, how will this engagement uh, be? Are you planning to send a U.S. official to Damascus to talk about uh, this issue? So this goes back to what we were, what I was saying in response to previous questions in the case of uh, Trevor Reed and Brittany Griner. We've often found uh, that we can. Um, move the ball forward most effectively uh, if we don't detail everything we're doing uh, in public, if we do have space to conduct uh, behind the scenes uh, discussions. In the case of Austin Tice, uh, this is an American who has spent nearly a quarter of his life, almost 10 years of his uh, 40 years on this earth, uh, separated from his family. Uh, we have said before that uh, when our Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs uh, speaks with uh, other officials, speaks with regimes, speaks with actors uh, around the world. Uh, that is distinct from traditional diplomacy in many ways. Uh, and Ambassador Karstens has referred to it as hostage mm -hmm. diplomacy. Uh, so Ambassador Karstens can go places, he can talk to people uh, that others in this administration, in some cases, would not. Uh, but I'm just going to leave it there. That means he will be going uh, to negotiate with the I, regime and uh, will he talk with them about uh, uh, U.S.-Syria relations and uh, politics? I, I said nothing of the sort. I said that Ambassador Karstens is in a position uh, as a special presidential envoy for hostage affairs uh, to talk to individuals, to talk to governments, to talk to regimes uh, that others in this department or in this government uh, might not be in a position to do. He has done that before in his role. Uh, he has uh, been successful uh, in efforts to free Americans who have been unjustly detained uh, around the world, including in places where we don't have uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, and so we are going to seek to uh, continue uh, that track record of uh, bringing Americans home. And on Lebanon tomorrow, we'll uh, start the uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, what are your expectations? Well, the elections aren't until later this month. I believe they're uh, May 15th, but we do support free... We'll start tomorrow in the Arab world and uh, on Sunday in other world. But we do support free, fair, transparent, and on-time elections in Lebanon that represent the legitimate will of the Lebanese people uh, who are living through crises of historic proportion. Uh, we hope these elections will lead to a timely formation of government, of a government uh, that will quickly address uh, the challenges faced by uh, the people of Lebanon.
Yes, Jenny. This news is just breaking now, but I was wondering if you have any comment. Um, the Israelis are saying at least three people were killed in a suspected terror attack. Just I, I saw initial reports just as I uh, was walking in. Uh, if these reports are, are accurate, and certainly no reason uh, to doubt them. Uh, it would be the latest in what has been a string uh, of despicable uh, terrorist attacks uh, that have um, rocked Israel in, in recent weeks. Uh, we saw them uh, in uh, advance of uh, this holy period, uh, the confluence of Easter, of Passover, uh, of Ramadan. We saw them in advance uh, of the Negev summit, uh, and if this is what it appears to be, uh, it is something that we would condemn uh, in the strongest terms, our commitment to our Israeli partners, to Israel's security, uh, that is uh, ironclad and will provide uh, any and all assistance uh, that may be required in this case. Yes. Um, the reports that the CIA director told President Bolsonaro to stop casting doubts on the country's election system last year, did state also communicate a similar message? Uh, of course, I'm not going to speak to uh, any messages or any travel uh, that the CIA director may have uh, conveyed. Uh, what I will say is that uh, we have regularly engaged with our Brazilian partners. Uh, just last month, uh, we had a strategic dialogue, and uh, Toria Newland, our Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, and Jose Fernandez, uh, our Undersecretary of State for uh, Economic Affairs, uh, were both in uh, Brazil to continue these important conversations. Uh, our bottom line has been that, uh, like the United States, uh, Brazil is a uh, strong democracy, uh, and we both have a commitment to uh, ensure our democracies deliver for our people. We have high confidence in Brazil's democratic institutions. Uh, Brazil has a strong track record of free and fair elections with transparency and high levels of voter participation. And it's important that uh, Brazilians, as they look forward to their elections later this year, have confidence in their electoral systems and that Brazil, once again, is in a position to demonstrate to the world through these elections the enduring strength of Brazil's democracy. Yes. Thank you, Nat. Uh, regarding the JCPOA, uh, you have mentioned yesterday you are preparing for equally for the either scenario. So what is your plan B if the JCPOA doesn't work anymore? Uh, so you're referring to the fact that uh, the JCPOA uh, continues, we believe, to be in our national security interest. It continues to, believe, to be in our national security interest, principally uh, because uh, it would once again uh, put in a box Iran's nuclear program, a program that since 2018 has been in a position to gallop forward in ways that are unacceptable to us, that are unacceptable uh, to many of our allies and partners around the world. Uh, if we are going to be in a position to mutually return to uh, full compliance with uh, the JCPOA, what that would do is to once again uh, impose the most uh, stringent uh, set of, uh, uh, the most stringent uh, verification and monitoring regime uh, ever uh, peacefully negotiated. And importantly, it would prolong what is now a breakout time, that is to say the time it would take Iran to acquire the fissile material necessary uh, for a nuclear weapon if Iran decided uh, to pursue the path of weaponization. It would prolong uh, that period, a period that once again for us is unacceptably short. Uh, so we know the status quo uh, can't endure uh, for long. Uh, and so either we're going to be in a position uh, to return to compliance with the JCPOA and to see those restrictions once again imposed on Iran's nuclear program, or we're going to have to pursue a different path. It has been clear to us since the beginning uh, that a mutual return to compliance uh, was never guaranteed. It was never a certainty. Uh, so discussions with our allies and partners regarding an alternative approach, uh, that is not something that we've undertaken only in recent days or even recent weeks. Uh, these are discussions that we have had uh, for a number of months now uh, with allies uh, and partners around the world. President Biden has a commitment uh, that Iran must never be able to acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, the JCPOA, if that is back in force, will be the vehicle to carry that out. Uh, but we are engaging with allies and partners around the world uh, to devise uh, a means by which uh, we will be able to make good on President Biden's commitment whether or not there is a JCPOA. Uh, is the military option on the table? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, is military option still on the table? Uh, we believe that diplomacy and dialogue uh, pre uh, presents us with the most uh, effective, sustainable, durable uh, means by which to ensure Iran will never acquire a nuclear weapon. So on this, uh, do you remember the first time that you actually said that um, you, you guys have to prepare for a world in which there is no, potentially there is no JCPOA? I mean, it wasn't yesterday. How many months ago do you Well, as I as, as, as I just said. You think you, that, that, but that, but Matt, you're 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 making my point. As I just said, when I'm we not start trying to make any point, I'm uh, trying to well, I'm just surprised that people all of a sudden took this yesterday that you said we have to prepare for this one. Uh, like it's something new. I was you've I was I was surprised that, by that too. You've been saying yes. this for months, right? I was do you remember what month you first start, start I, I, started? I I don't, but 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 as I just alluded to, I'm sure you do, and you'll tell me in just a second. No, but, no, no. Oh, okay. I, I, I didn't I actually Oh I see. It was a genuine question. I I I all of my questions. Questions are genuine. Uh, what, Except what, when they're not. <laughs> Except when they're hypothetical. What I will tell you is that when we started this process in April of 2021, April more than a year ago now, uh, it was never a certainty, it was never a guarantee that we would get back to a point uh, of mutual return to compliance. We always knew it was un an uncertain proposition, uh, so we started preparing for this reality, uh, to your right. point, to your very valid point, quite some time ago. Yeah, okay, exactly. So now, in terms of the, the, the debate over this assessment or alleged assessment uh, about whether or not it has already the window has already closed and that it no longer makes sense, uh, according to some people, that this assess assessment says that it no longer makes sense to re to to rejoin the, the JCPOA. Um, is there a is, is there a situation in which the, even though you can't get everything you want in terms of breakout time uh, with the JCPOA, that the administration still believes that it is in the U.S. national security interest to come back into compliance with it. So to the first part of your question, I just want to be clear about this because I know there has been some misinformation, potentially disinformation out there. Uh, there is no secret assessment, quote unquote, uh, that a mutual return to full implementation of the JCPOA is no longer in our national interest. Okay, so, uh, all right, stop right there. Let me just say, so what is Senator Menendez talking about? Not I, Senator Cruz, Senator Menendez. I, and he I, says that he understands from classified or unclassified guy, I don't know what, but he understands from the administration that the window actually closed in February. We, so is he just making this up? What, what I can tell you is that our experts, our experts here, our experts in the intelligence community and elsewhere, uh, we are constantly assessing uh, the non-proliferation -prolifer gains of a potential return to the JCPOA. Uh, that is the metric we use. We compare where we are now to the potential uh, non-proliferation gains of a possible uh, return to compliance with the JCPOA. At this stage, such a return would still achieve our most important and most urgent uh, non-proliferation goals and would, at least in the view of the administration, uh, strongly be in our national interest. That is why we continue to pursue, at least for the moment, a mutual return to compliance. Now, uh, to uh, the point that others have raised, uh, there will come a time when the assessment of uh, the non-proliferation benefits that a return to the JCPOA would bring when that assessment renders the fact uh, that Iran's program has advanced too far, uh, that rendering a potential return to the JCPOA is no longer in our interest. In, but we are not at that point. In this, in, in this situation, are you saying that U.S. broader national U.S. security interests are entirely dependent on the non-proliferation part of it? Or is there a, or is there a way in which you would assess that even if you don't get what you're looking for in terms of breakout time, that it could still be in the U.S. national interest to go back. In. This is a non-proliferation deal. And that's it. And we it look at it through a non-proliferation lens. And that's it. There is, no, at, other, we, there is no other lens. That through a, through a non-proliferation lens, comparing a potential return to compliance with the JCPOA to where we are now, uh, it is in our advantage to return to the JCPOA. Uh, you know, the, the, the famous saying from President Biden, uh, don't compare us to the almighty, compare us to the alternative. The JCPOA is the best alternative. It remains the best alternative at the moment. Uh, that won't be the case forever.
What is the Robert Mali at this time? Uh, what is he doing? The last time I saw uh, Rob was a few days ago. He was in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is uh, always on the phone. He's talking to uh, our European allies. He's talking to uh, other stakeholders. Uh, and until and unless there's reason for him to uh, return to Vienna, I suspect he will continue to do a lot of that from here. Uh, my last one on this. Just what, what do you make, if anything, of this uh, Senate vote yesterday? On the, I mean, I know it's non-binding, but it, is a, it was a pretty clear, um, you know, shot across the bow of the administration. Uh, so it was a vote on uh, the China bill, and we do look forward to the rapid passage of legislation uh, that President Biden can sign to boost our competitiveness vis-a-vis uh, -vis well, the PRC. About the Iran. Well, it was it was part of the part well, of the package. I understand that, but but, but <laughs> to to right. to to like you know me asking you to describe an elephant and you say well elephants are scared of mice. Well, a the, mouse is a little brown, brown animal, whatever. The right? problem I'm asking is you about the Iran. I part know, of this, but the problem is that you you very quite a few. You interrupted them. me before I could finish my first <laughs> sentence, and the second clause right. of my well, first you, sentence was going to say we are aware of the non-binding Iran-related instruction. Uh, to Senate conferees that was passed yesterday. Uh, as I said before, the president's commitment is that Iran will not obtain a nuclear weapon. He's been clear uh, that at this point, the best way to realize that is through a mutual return to compliance with uh, the JCPOA. That is what Rob Malley and his team are uh, seeking to achieve at the moment. Uh, we do share the concern expressed by the Senate. Uh, about other aspects of Iran's behavior, including their development of ballistic missiles, a support for terrorism through the IRGC and other elements. And that's why our administration has actually increased uh, sanctions on Iran's ballistic missile program and on the IRGC over uh, the past year. There is nothing in a potential return to the JCPOA that would in any way diminish our resolve or our ability to continue combating these aspects of Iran's policies in the region. Uh, if uh, this math is uh, still correct, of the 107, uh, 107 sanctions that we have applied on Iran since January 20th of 2021, uh, 86 of those, which if my math is right, uh, about three quarters of those, uh, have been on the IRGC. Uh, we are committed uh, to doing all we can, pulling every lever we can to take on the threat together with our partners from uh, the IRGC. Now, having said all that, we know that all of these problems are even more intractable, even more in challenging, um, in challenging uh, if Iran also is in a position to have a nuclear program that is unconstrained. Uh, that is why we have always been of the mindset that the decision to withdraw from an agreement that was demonstrably working uh, to prevent Iran from uh, obtaining a nuclear weapon has comprehensively failed to protect our national security interests, uh, and in fact, has actually resulted in the opposite. It has resulted in uh, an Iran that is more aggressive, that is more uh, destabilizing, uh, and its proxies uh, could uh, be called the same. Okay, but it, it is still uh, the administration's position that you do not believe that you can get anything outside of the uh, nuclear stuff into a uh, return to the JCPOA. In other words, just as it was in 2015, the missiles, uh, the, the support for extremists, uh, etc. You're not looking to get that into just get that into into a deal. The JCPOA is about one thing okay. and one thing only, and that's Iran's nuclear okay. program. So then, is this the end of the longer and stronger thing that you guys have been had been talking about? It since, is. You know, it, February of last year. Is is, is is I as I said before, we are committed. Uh, to working with our allies uh, and partners to address these other challenges right. that but the JCPOA is not going to be longer and stronger. The even, first step, even, the first step. Well, but, like, no, no, no. But but if you get a, J, a, a deal to return, it isn't going to be longer and stronger. The first the first step is testing the proposition as to whether we can mutually uh, return to compliance with the JCPOA. I, I that, that that's the first step. Okay. Now, going back to the point about hypotheticals, it's far from clear that we'll, we'll get there. It wasn't a hypothetical. This no, no, is but the administration came into, into office saying, not only do we want to, want to return to the JCPOA, but we want to make it longer and stronger, sort of one whole thing. And I just want to make sure that, that what you're saying now is that you have essentially, uh, you know, given up might be a, a 
pejorative here, but you do don't believe that it is all that it it that it is at all possible to include other things that weren't covered by the original. We have we have in, we have we have in a new one. We have always said that a first step is putting a box back on top of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, that is a first step. It is, to my point a moment ago, a hypothetical as to whether we'll be able to do that, uh, because it's far from certain whether uh, a mutual return to the JCPOA uh, will be in the offing or not. Uh, whether we're able to get there or if we're not able to get there, uh, we are still going to work with partners and allies and still engage in diplomacy uh, to uh, see to it uh, that we can take on these other challenges uh, that Iran poses to the region uh, and by extension to us. And that includes uh, the IRGC and its ballistic missile program, among other uh, challenges, Gita. Um, Ned, you, when you talk about Iran's uh, advances to a point where the benefits of the JCPOA will not be realized anymore, um, about that, nuclear experts believe that at a certain point, um, anybody, anybody with nuclear capabilities can um, produce crude nuclear bombs, which is one level, obviously, uh, less than the actual bigger <laughs> size one. Does the administration differentiate between these two? Because uh, according to David Albright, he, in, in early April, he estimated that between mid-April and end of April, Iran would have enough 60% to manufacture a crude bomb. Does the administration differentiate? Do you, are you waiting until it, it does 90%? We have a commitment that Iran must never be able to acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the reason why we have uh, pursued a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, is not only uh, that it would uh, define what Iran can't do and to impose the most stringent verification uh, and monitoring regime ever negotiated, uh, but it would give the international community, principally through the IAEA, uh, greater transparency into all of the potential pathways uh, that Iran could seek to illicitly uh, acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, so to have an agreement that has uh, these caps, that has a stringent verification and monitoring regime, and as a result, uh, that affords uh, much greater levels of transparency uh, to international weapons inspectors, uh, this is why the JCPOA remains, at least for the moment, uh, manifestly uh, in our interest. Well, sure, but by now, Iran may have enough 60% to manufacture a smaller um, explosive. Uh, that doesn't count. Uh, you're you're raising something that again falls in the category of hypotheticals. Uh, we are uh, we have made clear that we are determined. The president has a commitment uh, that Iran won't be able to uh, acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, we want to uh, see to it that uh, we put everything in place in a way that is sustainable, in a way that uh, is durable, in a way that is transparent, uh, so that. Uh, not only can uh, we prevent this, uh, but if Iran seeks to manufacture a nuclear weapon, if it seeks to manufacture, uh, as you put it, uh, a crude nuclear device, uh, that is something that uh, we would able to uh, detect early on. All right. Thank you no, very much. I got one oh, more. Okay. I okay. Just, I, I'm just wondering if you have a, 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 any kind of an update on this um, uh, child custody slash uh, abduction issue in, in, in Nepal. Uh, not an update since we last talked about it. I think, as you know, uh, this is a matter that is uh, before a court in uh, Nepal. Our priority and responsibility uh, is to assist U.S. citizens the most effective way possible. Uh, the embassy in Kathmandu, the department, are working diligently to uh, assist uh, the family member. In this case, embassy personnel are in regular contact uh, with the father. They've informed him of all developments uh, in this case. Well, well, but you, 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 you do not consider this to be a case of a, a child being abducted from India into Nepal? We are not characterizing this case as an international parental child abduction to Nepal. Uh, gotcha. Yes. But, well, continue. Okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the fuller facts. We, we understand the facts of the case to be the following. Uh, the child's Indian national mother was wrong, uh, wrongfully retained the U.S. citizen child in India in 2017. The father, who's a U.S. citizen, immediately secured a court order in Cook County, Illinois, 
determining he had sole custody of the child while she was still unlawfully uh, retained in India with her mother. Uh, in light of the mother's actions, the department considers the case to be an international parental child abduction case between the U.S. and India, and the U.S. has formally raised it with the Indian government on several occasions, urging uh, a swift resolution. In April of this year, the father, while visiting the child, departed India with her across the border to Nepal. Uh, both parents are now in Nepal. Daphne. Uh, Sorry, Matt. No, oh, I'm done. Thank you. Do I you said thank you. Do you have any update on Blinken's China speech? Will it be rescheduled? It will be rescheduled. Uh, I do not have a date to offer at this time, but I can assure you that we will uh, find uh, a date at the earliest opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.